Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us at today's webinar, Hurricane Damage Using Pix4D Mapper and NV Deep Learning. Before we get going here, I have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, your lines are muted, so if you need to ask a question in the GoToWebinar dialog there, there's that little questions area, and you can type in questions to us. We'll try to answer some of those as we go and then um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. The other thing is that we are recording this presentation, so we will make that recording available along with the slides afterwards. I think it'll be on Monday before we reach back out to you to um, tell you where you can pick up the slides and get all of that from our website. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started today. Next slide. Here's a quick look at the agenda for the webinar. We'll do some introductions. There's four of us here and we'll introduce everybody real quickly, take a look at uh, the companies, L3 Harris and PIX4D, and a little bit about our product line. And then we'll walk through a real life disaster response case, use case. And we really wanna explain and demonstrate the PIX4D, the photogrammetry uh, workflow there and then demonstrate um, NV Deep Learning and how you do the imagery training and classification there to extract certain features from the data that's collected through PIX4D Mapper. And then we'll have time for Q&A afterwards there. Before we kick off the slides, I wanna, I have a couple of quick poll questions I wanna do, so I'm gonna launch one of those. And if you can reply to this, does your organization currently use drones? We'll wait a few moments here to get some feedback. All right, I'm gonna share the result of that real quickly. So um, it looks like we have quite a few people, over 50% using drones and then another 25% hoping to soon. So that's great. I'll go ahead and hide that now. And uh, we'll continue on. Next slide. All right, quick intros. My name is Bill Okubo. I am part of the product management team at L3 Harris Geospatial. With me today is Chris Cressy of PIX4D. Chris is the managing director of North America. And then also from PIX4D is Josh Haga. Josh is technical sales engineer. And then last but not least is JP Metcalf. JP is a solutions engineer with L3 Harris. And those two guys, Josh and JP, are really gonna do the heavy lifting of the uh, uh, demonstration that's the meat of the presentation. Um, next slide. So, um, a little bit about L3 Harris. L3 Harris Technologies is a global aerospace and defense contractor who delivers end-to-end -end solutions. The corporate office is based out of Melbourne, Florida, and JP and myself are with L3 Harris Geospatial, which is based in Broomfield, Colorado. We are the software, commercial software group of L3 Harris, and the NV and IDL software are our flagship products that we offer here. Next slide. So I'll dig into a little bit of the core products of L3 Harris Geospatial. NV is our remote sensing image processing software application. Most of you probably know a little bit about it. NV Sarscape is a key module that's available for it. That is a module for processing of synthetic aperture radar imagery and that seems to be an up and coming area of analysis in the technical realms. Down below is NV Server. That's a new offering that we have that allows you to push large processing jobs off to the background of NV or even um, servers that are in a uh, network connected to the machine that you run NV on. IDL is interactive data language. That is the language that NV is really built on and it's a lot like Python. Uh, it existed before Python came about. Jaguar is a data catalog and dissemination capability for uh, imagery and motion uh, uh, video. 
and that's primarily used in the military. Down below, we have Amplify, which is a SaaS offering that's also kind of similar in that it catalogs imagery and disseminates that out to uh, the client side, but it's specific to the utilities industry. And then we also have Helios, which is another uh, SaaS offering that really is meant to deliver uh, real-time road weather information and imagery that's based on networks of um, uh, transportation cameras throughout the U.S. and actually worldwide. And then we have a data and imagery division. We resell data from various vendors that supply imagery, and we also provide services for uh, those, those products as well. Next slide. So NV, it is the environment for visualizing imagery. That's the leading remote sensing imagery, Im Im image processing product. And it has support for all sorts of uh, image file formats. It can support LIDAR data. And then, you know, the processing is all the typical types of feature classification you'd want to do. And specifically, we offer some uh, deep learning neural network capabilities that we're going to focus on today. Next slide. So our products really address multiple markets. And the big one that we want to focus on today here is disaster response. So um, the, the images there talk to some other areas where disaster response analytics is really helpful. Out here in the Western US, the wildfires that are happening right now, that's a big example of the kind of uh, place where you can use the Envy technology. Landslides, flooding, those are also common things. And we have another hurricane coming in uh, this this weekend here, so um, down in the south. So, you know, these things come up quickly and frequently. So really the priority when you're working disaster response is to rapidly assess the extent of the damage and then task the resources that are going to help in the recovery. They need to know where, how severe the situation is and what the damage really is. So again, using the NV Deep Learning module, we're going to focus on some feature extraction from the data that's collected and processed in PIX4D. Next slide. So L3 Harris is a authorized re PIX4D reseller. We began this per partnership in 2020, and the idea is to really bring together the remote sensing image processing of Envy with the PIX4D photogrammetry processing capabilities. And our focus is on those users who really need the bundled software mix. So people who want to use both. And um, if you do need to know more information about how you can buy PIX4D through L3 Harris Geospatial, you can contact one of our sales representatives or our distributors. And there's some email information there that um, you can refer to if need be. So at this point, before I turn it over to Chris, I'm gonna do one more quick poll, and then we'll move on. And the question is, do you currently use Pix4D Mapper, Envy, or neither? So if folks can give us a quick answer on that. I'll wait a moment. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and show you the result of that. So pretty even blend there between Envy and PIX4D Mapper users. So that's nice to see there. Um, so a lot of you will be familiar with the technologies and I think you'll get some great additional information on the presentation. All right, so I'm gonna hide that and I am gonna turn it over to Chris. Very good, thanks Bill. Well, and, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're extremely happy and excited to be here with, with L3 Harris. You know, when we started this partnership, um, you know, we envisioned that, you know, the, the putting our two products together with, with customers would provide capabilities that, that we really hadn't, couldn't do either one on our own. So um, looking forward to the feedback that you give us at, um, about the products and, and the workflow we're gonna show you today. Next slide. A little bit about PIX4D. Uh, Josh and I are coming to you from our Denver 
uh, headquarters in the U.S. Um, the company headquarters is in Lausanne, Switzerland, and we also have offices in Berlin, Madrid, China, and Japan. Um, we were founded in 2011, so we're actually kind of a mature startup at this point. We have over 200 employees. Uh, we have over 55,000 active users of our products. And our customers do a lot of mapping with drones primarily. Uh, you can have, this was from 2019. We, we, mapped, we track you know, the usage and so forth. And we had over 570,000 square kilometers of uh, projects mapped in, in, in use last year. Next slide. So it was, it was good to see we had kind of an even mix of PIX4D and, and MB users, and some people hadn't used either of them. So uh, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background. I think it's really fascinating. You know, photogrammetry is what the science of our software is based on. And photogrammetry means, essentially the word itself uh, means measure from images. And I think most people in the room, even if you haven't you know, looked at the science of photogrammetry, you probably have an, an intrinsic idea, intuitive idea of how it works. Your eyes give you binacular, binocular vision, and binocular vision means you can sense depth by parallax from your two eyes. And that's essentially how photogrammetry works. It allows you to measure distances and, in fact, now locations and, 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 and more in, in the real world from multiple photographs. Next slide. And the science itself, I, I put this together for a recent talk. I, I think it's really interesting, to me at least. Um, the science kind of dates back, the precursor of the science dates back all the way to the 15th century. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci being the, the most famous for using the new science of perspective transformation and, and vanishing lines and um, in, in use to create very accurate scale drawings and paintings of architectural scenes. And you can see a, an example of one of his famous sketches in the top right. Um, in, in the 1800s, mid 1800s, with the advent of the invention of photography and cameras, um, people started actually applying these techniques to do what was coined photogrammetry. And again, you take two photographs and start to use the photographs to reconstruct accurate scale drawings of architectural scenes. So that, you know, it was still a pretty manual process, obviously, but people were, you know, that was the uh, genesis of the science. In, in the early 1900s, aircraft were invented. And what do you know, people started putting cameras on aircraft and doing photogrammetry from camera photographs taken from the air and measuring things on the ground. Um, that kind of was how things worked for about 100 years, actually, in, for aerial photography. Things got a little faster, you know, it was mechanical for about 50 years. In the 60s and 70s, computer software started coming along, uh, computer vision techniques and software started, you know, being applied to this. Uh, in the 1900s, 1990s, the GPS system was launched, and now all of a sudden you could get the location of your camera it, when you flew it in the aircraft. Pretty cool. Um, that still things up until about you know, early 2000s were done pretty much manually. You look on the bottom of the screen, that pictorial shows you, pretty much gives you an idea of how things were done. You'd fly an aircraft, you take a, a photograph from two different locations with stereoscopic you know, views. You can basically, if you know the location and the camera model, you can measure things on the ground. And people did this to, you know, to, met, to do uh, photographic, photogrammetric uh, reconstruction of scenes, but it was still a very slow process. In 2008, that all changed. Structure from motion was a new algorithm. Our founder uh, and CEO, Christoph Strecha, was one of the early researchers in this. And what it does is it changed the whole way it works. You now take a, a large number of camera poses, photographs, and from that, you have a giant mathematical optimization problem that solves for the location of the cameras, the camera model, and a huge dense point cloud uh, from the imagery, uh, all in one optimization problem. And that was really fundamentally different. That, that changed the way that the photography photogrammetry worked. Then, not too long after that, uh, drones got cheap. The DJI Phantom was launched in 2013. Pix4D Mapper, our desktop product was launched in 2014. 
all of a sudden people had a tool that could run on their desktop computer that could basically democratize the use of photogrammetry, create digital twins on a very large scale, very cheaply, very cost effectively. One person could do things that took a, you know, a spacecraft or an aircraft system to do before. Um, all, and, and that really is where we are today, except that I'd say the, the big change uh, is that now these same techniques and our products and, and drones are being used in many, many different fields. So we're gonna see an example of that today in disaster response and public safety, but it's being used in many other fields as well. Next slide. Uh, another pictorial again, photographs reconstructed to create dense point clouds um, with, the, with PIX4D Mapper. Next slide. So this is an example of the outputs and uh, the primary output from photogrammetry and PIX4D Mapper is a full color, three-dimensional point cloud output in the standard format. Other derived products would be an ortho mosaic, a scale image. So you may have hundreds of separate images from a drone flight and the product, the PIX4D Mapper creates a single scale image, typically GeoTIFF format that's geolocated, that's, that's an actual scale two-dimensional image of the entire scene. Similarly, we can create a, a digital surface model, which is a two and a half D you know, height field of the surface. Um, we can create a three-dimensional textured mesh for visualization and computer software, or even on cell phones. And then lastly, uh, it's not just restricted to RGB, you know, visible, visible light imagery. The same techniques can be used on multispectral imagery, typically used for agriculture, and on thermal imaging for many different applications, inspection, solar farms, and so forth. Um, with that, and one, one thing to note here is all these inputs can go directly into Envy. So I think that's one of the really powerful things we're going to show you here. The workflow is you can take all these different outputs, use them in Envy, and do machine learning, deep learning techniques on the combination of these things. Next slide. And I guess the last point I want to make is that, uh, you know, the, again, the, the use of this is exploding in many different fields. It started out being kind of a surveying tool with PIX4D Mapper and, and, uh, and photogrammetry. Now we're seeing it GIS, mining, agriculture, construction, public safety, uh, transportation, uh, many, many different fields are, are using these same techniques. Next slide. So PIX4D has a lot of products. PIX4D Mapper is the main product we're gonna show, our flagship product um, that does everything, full three-dimensional reconstruction and a variety of outputs. We also have cloud products, a survey product for vectorization, and uh, GIS and CAD, uh, fields and react for ag and public safety that are fast mapping, and some specialty inspection products. Um, today, next slide, we'll focus on PIX4D Mapper. I just wanted to be aware that these specialized products as well as Mapper can all be used with NB um, and produce data sets that can, can work with NB. And last slide. And so today we'll focus on PIX4D Capture, which is our free flight app for flying the drones and capturing the imagery, PIX4D Mapper, um, I just wanted to point out for public safety disaster response, PIX40 React is a lower cost uh, 2D mapping product that allows you to create two dimensional ortho mosaic maps, basically faster than you can fly the drone on a laptop in the field without a network connection. Uh, very useful for public safety in, in many different types of applications. So we're gonna show you the full 3D uh, system today with Mapper. But keep in mind, if you just need 2D, you could do React and do the same workflow. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Josh. Josh is gonna take you through a real world example of mapping for hurricane disaster response. And then from there, we'll show you how the outputs are created from PIX4D and, and, then, and then used. JP will take you through the workflow in NV for machine learning and, and uh, deep learning. Josh? Awesome. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Um, so now listeners have a pretty good and hopefully a pretty good understanding of the history of photogrammetry and some of uh, some information about PIX4D as a company, some information about L3 Harris as a company. So now we're gonna make a little 
shifting gears a little switch and we're actually going to focus on the use case that a lot of you joined here today to to hear a little bit more about um so chris talked a lot about um how the science of photogrammetry has sort of evolved you saw that long list of how it's gone through history and it's become this really really powerful product um and what we've learned and what a lot of our customers have learned over time is this this software and this tool is really powerful for natural disaster response public safety and i'm going to go over and i'm going to focus on the image capture process and the processing workflows um, that occurred in response to hurricane maria in 2017 so we're going to go over that project now so this is a high level project overview um, that you guys are looking at now so this is a look at our area of interest that we're focusing on for this use case. So this is a video animation, a really cool, really neat uh, video animation taken directly from Pix4D Mapper um, that we're going around now. And we're focusing on for this project, a very small portion of a much larger operation in a much larger area um, that occurred in response to Hurricane Maria in 2017. So just, a much smaller area on the on Dominica Island uh, back in 2017. And you can get a strong understanding as we're flying over this um, and a good idea of some of the destruction, some of the debris you can see right there with the beach and the water. It's very much so a coastal city. And just looking down here, you can see some of the debris, some roofs missing, tarps. You just get a real good idea of what's actually happening on the ground there. So for the acquisition method, so acquisition is always an important step. It's one step to the two-step process of getting your data and then processing it. So the imagery for this project was captured and processed uh, by a really great nonprofit organization, Global Medic, um, and they quickly respond to global emergencies all around uh, the world, and um, they use drones to map out areas that that need assistance and quick mapping applications to help the, the response in these areas and use the, uh, the maps to make educated decisions. So Global Medic, thank you for letting us use this data set. And to give you guys a little rundown on the actual project and, and what we used and some of the stats around the actual flight and getting the data, the drone we used for this project or Global Medic used was the DJI Inspire 2. And the camera fixed to this drone was the Zenmuse X4S camera, which uh, for all of you guys, if you don't know the X4S, it's a 20 megapixel camera. So a standard uh, resolution camera that a lot of people use. So flight stats for the actual acquisition process. In total, uh, Global Medic captured 920 images. And then for this sample project, we're looking at 150 acres. Uh, of the much larger project area that they flew on the island of Dominica. And the flight height for this particular mission was 345 feet above ground level. And then the flight time was 22 minutes, which is roughly one battery life from the Inspire 2. So because we're talking about image acquisition, it's always good to bring up pix 4 Capture. So pix 4 Capture is our great and free flight app. So it's our 100% free flight application. It can be installed on both Android and iOS devices. And um, the app will automatically take, it'll automatically fly your drone. So from the moment you connect the app to the drone, it'll take off the drone. It'll automatically fly it and capture images for processing later. And then it'll land the drone automatically. So it makes the process very efficient, very easy. And uh, the app is completely free. So it's a really nice tool to use out in the field. So the app supports all the popular drones that are available on the market for the most case. Um, right there you can see three of the big players in the industry, DJI, Parrot, and Unique. Um, and the app supports a majority of those drones. And then over here on the right hand side, under flight missions, we have some pretty cool graphics right there. Uh, polygon, grid, double grid, circular. You can sort of see the different mission types that Pix4D Capture offers. And you're going to select a different mission depending on um, your project area. So a really cool free app. Um, go ahead and download it and give it a try um, if you have a drone. 
So processing, we've gone out and we've acquired the data now once we have to process it. Um, in this particular use case, we used a locally installed version of pix 40 Mapper. Like Chris said, this software can be used totally offline um, in a local environment, which is really nice in disaster response. Uh, you don't need to go back to the office or need an internet connection. You can do everything out there in the field uh, where it matters and where it counts. So when you process this data locally, um, it's really, really important to have uh, certain computer specifications for certain projects. So those are always important. And up here on the screen, uh, I have the CPU, the RAM, and the GPU that was used for this particular project. And the software is going to utilize all three of those factors when going through and crunching the numbers and analyzing the data and, and giving you these outputs that I'm gonna go over here in a second. So just to give you guys a, a high level overview of the actual project and processing, project setup, really fast, only took five minutes, and then actual processing took nine hours. And a good thing to note on this is, this isn't nine hours of someone sitting at the computer and, and clicking buttons and interacting with the software. This is just nine hours of the software actually just analyzing the data and doing everything automatically. So for project setup, now that we've captured our imagery out in the field, our global medics gone out there and captured this great data set on the island of Dominica, um, we have these 920 images. We are going to take the SD card out of our drone. We're going to pop it into our desktop computer. And then we're going to load them into Pix4D desktop, which we're looking at now. And as we zoom in here, you can sort of see geographically where this project took place. So very much a coastal city on the island. And what we're looking at now is we have a whole bunch of red dots, so 920 red dots. And each of those individual dots represents a single photo that we took out in the field. And then amongst these red dots, we have a green line that shows the rough flight pattern that the drone took out in the field. And then we can go ahead, as we're showing in the video here, we can click on one of these red dots and sort of inspect one of these, indi one of these individual photos, which is nice. So once you import those images, you can sort of get a lay of the land, get an idea of the mission, and click on some of these and get a high resolution look at what you actually flew out in the field. And in this case, you can see the damage like we saw in that video animation earlier. So after we've imported the data into Pix4D Mapper Desktop and we've gone ahead and set up the project and got everything lined up, now we can actually process the data. So now we're just gonna go over the outputs that come out of the software once everything's been automatically created. So now we're in complete 3D space. You can see those 3D or those images in 3D above and the 3D point cloud below. So all of these, this data product that we're looking at down low is a 3D point cloud. So everything is an individual 3D point. And as we click around this point cloud, you can see all of these green lines shoot up from the point cloud. So that's sort of what Chris was talking about earlier. Every single point you click on in the point cloud, um, will reference the images in which it appears in, which is really nice. And it just shows you the power of the technology. So, and another thing to note about the point cloud is for this particular project, we captured just over 5 million points for this 150 acre plot of, of, of space that we mapped in the sample project. So a lot of points. Another output, another great output that uh, Pix4D automatically generates is a high resolution 2D map or what we call an ortho mosaic. So we had originally 920 images and then we go through and combine all of those 920 images into a single file type known as our 2D ortho mosaic, which we're looking at now. So no seams, no, no incontinuities between these separate images, just one nice, beautiful looking high resolution 2D map. <clears throat> we're sort of panning across it here and then for this for this use case in this map given the flight parameters and the camera that we used uh, the resolution of this ortho mosaic is 4.5 centimeters or um, 1.8 inches so that was the ground sampling distance for this map that we got out of pix4d so moving on 
So onto another output is the, and this one that you guys can see up on the screen now is the digital surface model or the DSM and the software is automatically creating this one as well. So this is going to be an elevation data product that shows how the elevation sort of changes throughout your project area. So on the right hand side in red, we have higher elevation and on the bluer side or on the left side um, in blue and green, we have lower elevation. So as we zoom in here, you can sort of see the elevation changes. You can see some buildings in there. You can see some bumps and lumps in between the buildings. That's the debris, some fallen trees. And um, JP, who's going to be presenting next about um, NV and the deep learning process, he's going to go over a bit more about how he used the DSM in analyzing this damage and, and, and identifying um, some of the features in the DSM and in these data products. So the last output that I want to talk about that came out of Pix4D for this project was the DTM or the digital terrain model. So in the last figure, the last video we showed, or I showed the DSM or the digital surface model, and that was an elevation model that showed everything in the entire project area. It showed houses, debris, um, fallen trees, showed the ground surface and everything above the ground. Well, the DTM is really cool because our software will automatically filter the DSM, which we looked at a second ago, of all of the above ground features, and it'll just give you a bare earth uh, ground model of your actual site. So right here, when we're looking at it, we don't see any houses. We see how the elevation sort of naturally changes in the project. In the middle, you can sort of see a, a natural canal or river that flows through the site. So you can get an idea of the topography in the area. So let me summarize what I just talked about, um, just from a high level overview. So the first step, uh, what Global Medic did for this use case, they went out and they collected these 920 images. Then we imported those images in step two, uh, and we processed them in Pix4D Mapper on our local computer out in the field which roughly took nine hours. And then after we're done processing this data, all these outputs that I just showed you, now we're going to export them. And when you export them out of Pix4D Mapper, we export them, or the software supports all the popular file formats that are available on the market. Um, but in this case, we're exporting them specifically for Envy. So JP is gonna talk about a little bit more now um, that we've made these data products. Now we're gonna roll over to Envy and show you what type of cool things you can do with these data products with some post analysis. So with that, I'll go ahead and I'll switch it over to JP. Thanks, Josh. Yep. Let me set up Here's my screen here. Is my, my screen showing? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So once again, yeah, my name is JP, and uh, and I'll be showing you what I did with the products from Pix4D uh, in Envy. Uh, so this year, uh, we've had an enormous amount of hurricanes come through North America. Uh, so many that we've gone through the names, and we're now into the Greek alphabet. Um, so here, uh, if you haven't seen NV interface before, on the right, I have that um, high resolution ortho photo uh, open. Um, zooming in a little bit, a uh, little chip on the left, um, we can start to see the detail of uh, what we might be interested in and what, uh, and start to think about what we want, might want to give to uh, first responders in order to uh, make decisions. So looking at it a little bit, we can see uh, some rooftop materials uh, on the ground um, have the same colors as the rooftops that are that are still intact. Uh, there's a blue tarp up there. There's a, there's a few buildings that have either uh, partial or completely missing rooftops, and we can see into their bedrooms and kitchens and uh, all sorts of cool stuff you can see inside. And uh, and kind of scattered throughout, we can see these palm trees where their trunks are exposed uh, since this is an ortho photo and everything uh, you know all the all the above ground uh, features have have their lean has been taken out um, knowing that we see their trunks uh, is an indication that they've 
fallen over or, or, or at least leaning. Um, so there are many classification methods. Uh, some work on um, spectral information or color. Uh, these uh, include um, supervised and unsupervised methods. Um, but for features like this, we're, we're only interested in a handful. We're, we're not interested in things like uh, just regular grass or um, roadways right now. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, focus on the deep learning module that will help us pick out those individual features. Uh, NV Deep Learning is a module that's an add-on that you can add to NV. It shows up as a toolbox. And it's based on TensorFlow uh, and Keras. And uh, it's, it's actually a modified UNet, uh, which we call NVNet5. Uh, integrates into NV very easily uh, with its own little GUI. And uh, if you want, you can stay completely within the GUI and there's, there would be no programming involved or you have the option to get into the the code, uh, like Bill mentioned, uh, that NV is built on IDL, so you can interact with it that way. So the idea behind the deep learning module is that you find features that you're interested in, and we're gonna we're gonna label those, and then we're gonna submit it to a brand new model and say, all right, model, let's learn what these features look like. And once that model is trained, we can set it off and and go look at different imagery. Like Josh said, is uh, this is this is only one portion of, uh, of that area, um, one data set. So once we train this model, we can apply it to the larger scale image. Uh, I do want to note that um, NV Deep Learning does run uh, well on a GPU or graphics processing unit, video card. Uh, and the way it does this is uh, you're able to um, use CUDA and its toolkit in order to uh, make some of the algorithms highly parallelizable. Uh, it will run on a CPU, but it'll be much slower. So looking at some of the, the, the damage classes, I've, I've found three that I think are, are useful. Uh, the first is structural damage right in the middle of the image. Um, like I said, it's uh, partially removed. And once that, uh, it looks like corrugated metal, once that flies off, lands on the ground, becomes debris. Uh, you can see inside, and, and we have this grid pattern from the, the exposed rafters. Uh, and we can, we can see that grid pattern throughout the, uh, the rest of the ortho photo. And I want to use that grid pattern or, or a texture um, as a feature you know, to put in deep learning. Um, next, we have debris, which is littered throughout. It's the same color as the roof, intact rooftops. Um, so using deep learning will help discriminate these. Um, we also have uh, fallen trees. Uh, they're, they're sparsely located uh, throughout the image, um, but we, what we want to do is capture those uh, tree trunks. Uh, so another thing to note, um, Josh mentioned all of the elevation products. Now we can import that and use that in a deep learning model because it's not it's not uh, limited to just three bands. Uh, so I want to use the height information of the debris, which is close to ground or relatively zero, uh, with the relative height of the buildings. And so we can discriminate between uh, intact roof and, and roof that's on the ground. So the first thing I do is I take that digital terrain model and the service model, and I subtract the terrain from the surface. And what that gives me is a, a normalized digital service model. And what that is, is uh, everything's uh, now in relative space or absolute height, um, where things on the ground are zero meters and uh, buildings are roughly you know, tens of meters. Uh, this, this becomes useful for finding uh, or isolating objects above the ground. Uh, this is very quickly and easily done with uh, NV band math, just a quick subtraction. So next thing we're going to want to do is once we once we take that uh, NDSM and we slide that right into that red, green, and blue ortho photo, now we have a four band image. Uh, so now we can start thinking about labeling. So looking at the, at the left-hand side, we have some debris scattered out, uh, various different sizes. We can see some cars and uh, some of that structural damage. So NV has the region of interest tool is primarily what we're gonna be using to uh, label these features. And that there's several different methods to label. You can use a point, which is just a single pixel. Uh, polyline for long linear features. 
and then there's polygons. Um, in the latest version, NV5.6, we've introduced a magic wand tool, uh, and it makes it just about as easy as clicking a, clicking a single point. So what that's going to do is it's going to find, uh, you, you click on, on our debris on the left here, and it'll reach out and find other pixels that are similar in, in, in color and uh, texture. And it's going to delineate that edge. And we can do that very quickly. And that's, that's uh, how we're going to handle the debris and the fallen trunks. Uh, so in this example on the right, um, just a piece of rooftop that I found. And I uh, used a magic wand and uh, created over well over 20 vertices that would have taken me at least a few minutes to be able to delineate that accurately. So going through the labeling process, uh, like I said, the, um, the debris kind of lends itself to the, the magic wand tool. So just quickly go through and find all these uh, fallen trunks. They have like this vein-like structure that, uh, that also is very useful uh, with that magic wand tool. For the structural damage, uh, it's more of a polygon. Uh, it doesn't really take that much time. I can see it. Uh, and just drop a few vertices, and uh, and then I can delineate the structural damage. Um, the labeling process is very important for deep learning, as uh, as we'll see. You you need to be very thorough on uh, labeling everything that's in the image that you see, uh, because we don't want any uh, negative feedback from um, classes that we forgot to label. Uh, the labeling process does take time, but in the end, it pays off. So once, once we've identified what we want to look for and uh, what we want to label, uh, inside of the deep learning toolbox, there is a guide map. And inside of this, it makes the, the whole process very simple. So we can start with a new model, or if we have uh, an already trained model, um, we can use additional training and validation to submit to that model. Or we can refine uh, an already created model by adding more information. Um, after we've identified that we want to start with a brand new model, in this case, uh, we can either say it's either a single class or a multi-class. I encourage everyone to use multi-class model. It's a later, uh, later edition and it performs very well on even a single class. Um, <clears throat> from that, we want to start labeling our rasters. And there's some other options. Let's say if you've had older projects where you've you went through and delineated a whole bunch of uh, things of interest in uh, any industry, and then you said, "All right, we're we're gonna we're gonna use this with deep learning now." The uh, that dialogue on the right will allow you to do that. So in our labeling tool, we have class definitions, and we have our three classes set in there and set set colors to them. Um, this tool is very useful because because it saves your session. So once you start adding images that you want to label, uh, it becomes uh, like a, a saving game of, of how many times can you save uh, and, and keep those that time that you took to label all these images. You'll see five images. I, I Since this is a very high resolution image, I chipped it up into eight different tiles and decided to label five. From there, um, it'll say, all right, three out of three of these regions of interest are labeled, so we can go ahead and hit train. Now on the right, there's gonna be a whole bunch of different parameters. Um, uh, an important one is that training and validation split slider that basically says, all right, out of five, of the, those five images that you have labeled, how many do you wanna use as training? How many will be actual uh, submitted to the model? And how many do you wanna use as validation? So once that model's weights are updated, we're gonna use that validation to figure out how accurate is this. There's a few parameters for distance. Uh, like I mentioned with the ROI tool, if, if you wanted to just use a polyline feature for those fallen trunks, you can set a distance of how far this, uh, this trainer will look out uh, in, in terms of pixels to find those features. Uh, moving on there towards the bottom, there is two models that are output. The first one is the best saved model. Or, uh, the best performing model, and then there's the last. And that the last would be after how many epics that you've set. And in this particular example, I've used 20. If clicking around in a guide map isn't your thing, uh, we also have NV Modeler. In NV Modeler, you can plug and play a bunch of different tasks. Uh, most most every, everything in deep learning is a task. 
um, set you up a bunch of different input parameters and outputs. Uh, and in the end, once you're satisfied with what you have, you can output as a Python program or an IDL program. Just makes it very easy for uh, repetitive tasks because uh, in that guide map, you can you can uh, look around to the same image over and over and over. So this makes it very simple. So now that I have all my labels and I want uh, the parameters that I had set, I hit train. A tensor board uh, HTML file will come up uh, in a browser and it'll show you four different metrics. Um, first uh, is accuracy, and, and in general, we want to see accuracy improve over time. Loss, we want to see that decrease. Precision, we also want to see increase over time. And recall. Uh, you can see here in my training session, my precision kind of dropped a little bit, uh, but no fear, the best model is saved. Uh, so, this particular hardware that I used was a, a laptop with the RTX Quadro 4000, has uh, over 2300 CUDA cores, uh, very helpful for uh, being able to distribute this process. My time it took it was 30 minutes, and that's per three classes. Uh, your training time will, will differ depending on what kind of hardware you have. So in the end, you get two products. The main one is the classification product. And with that height information, uh, found that to be very useful. If you look at the structural damage in orange, uh, we see that it's very well contained within buildings that have that higher absolute height. We see fallen trees throughout the creek bed, and then we have debris littered throughout. Um, if we look at them, we can see that they're not overlapping or not in areas where they should, there shouldn't be. There's, there's not uh, fallen trees on top of structural damage. Uh, we can save this out as a GIS output and send this off to the first responders and say, this is, this is where the damage is. Another output is the activation image. And activation is, uh, is another word for our probability. So activation image is, uh, is going to tell you what probability that a particular pixel falls within a class. Uh, I, we happen to have three classes and three different bands that we can uh, visualize. Uh, so in this image, we're looking at the probability uh, of each pixel that belongs to those classes. So very, very bright green uh, are most likely fallen tree. But this, this is very useful to, uh, to look at to figure out whether your deep, deep learning model uh, performed very well. Um, we can also see that not only is it showing fallen trees, but it's also showing other areas of vegetation. And you can use these activ activation images to threshold uh, to create different classes if you choose. Taking one of the activation images for structural damage, I uh, applied a raster color slice, it's called, uh, with a rainbow, uh, a rainbow range uh, from zero to one for probability. And, uh, and here we can see with the transparency over the original ortho photo of how well uh, the, the model used uh, was to predict the structural damage. So the very high red areas, uh, uh, very high indication that these are structural damage. And, and, and of course, you can always go back and say, all right, um, our classification image didn't grab as much, uh, but, so you can start to threshold these images to be able to produce different classifications. And with that, we'll begin to take questions. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, Josh and JP, that was a great uh, presentation and explanation there of the workflow of both products, Pix4D Mapper and NV Deep Learning. So um, just to summarize today, we, we spent a little bit of time looking at the companies, L3 Harris and Pix4D. We took a look, well, we heard a little bit about the uh, science of photogrammetry, and then we spent some time on PIX4D and how the data is actually captured from the UAV and processed to have product outputs that are then fed into Envy, and then using deep learning, we we're able to obtain the three feature classes. So, um, you know, a lot of good detail there. Thanks, guys. I think uh, there are some questions we um may want to answer and if you have any others please do type them in right now so looks like there's a number of um questions about pix4d 
All right, <clears throat> and I see some of those in there now. So Richard Brown asks, is there any option in Pix4D for downsampling those images to speed up the process? So if you need like a down graded resolution ortho mosaic, how would you get that if you wanted faster processing? So Richard, the first thing I would recommend for you is to look into our Pix4D React product. So that's another of our software products that's really geared towards disaster response. Um, and that software really focuses on just 2D analytics. So you import your, your drone imagery into React and it's gonna give you a low resolution orthomosaic in under five minutes. So if you're just looking for a quick orthomosaic to make uh, decisions on, I would say look at React. But another great thing about Pix4D Mapper, the software that we've been talking about, is you can actually do what I call looking under the hood. You can look at the processing options, you can check things out, and you can actually tweak some things um, to speed up processing and get a lower resolution model out of it. So that is an option. Looks like you have a bunch of Pix4D questions. There's a lot in here, lots of interest. So another question asked if we're looking at the debris and the soil for volume. Oh, it looks like Chris just answered that. Um, how accurate is the volume calculation? So when you look at how accurate a volume calculation is, you have to know what's actually there. So in our tests and our research and a lot of our white papers, we've shown um, when comparing photogrammetry to terrestrial LIDAR, which is really, really accurate. We have found a lot of our cal calculations are within 1% of those calculations at a maximum 5%, but in a lot of use cases, I've looked at 1% difference between what's actually there. So it's really, really accurate and a lot more efficient and using a drone is a lot easier than uh, using a terrestrial scanner in some cases. And if you're curious about that, Osvaldo, um, I would look into, we actually have this white paper published, so you can just quickly Google search Pix4D accuracy volume calculations, and we have a nice little write-up on that available online. Richard asked what the final GFD of that ortho photo was. It was 4.5 centimeters. Yeah, yeah, it was somewhere, yeah, it was 4.5 or 1.8 inches for the GSD of that ortho. For Richard there. And then another person asks, it's more about the speed of the ortho mosaic. Scott asked earlier and Chris kind of already answered this. So the entire processing for Pix4D took for this project nine hours. But like Chris said in the answers portion, the ortho mosaic really processed in probably two hours of that segment of processing because you have your point cloud, your DSM, your DTM, and the software is going through all these iteration steps of processing. The ortho mosaic probably only took two hours of those. Um, but like I said, if you need a faster ortho mosaic, uh, downgraded quality uh, for disaster response, I would definitely look into Pix4D React. JP, it looks like there's that one question from uh, Aditya about the um, data requirements for the training process. Yeah. So for data requirements, um, I, I'm assuming it's imagery. Uh, what do you need for the training? Well, uh, more than zero. Um, and how many labels? Um, so anywhere, uh, you, you want to be able to label everything that you see in that image. Um, there are some parameters that if you have classes that are not well represented, it's called a class weight parameter. It'll help to uh, balance out uh, between that rare class and the other classes that are present um, obviously the more labels the the better accuracy that you'll see oh and claudia just wrote it this is an awesome question so um she says that she's been working with pictures from social media and google maps after hurricane maria um as a digital volunteer could these be used so this is an interesting point so as, a, as, a, as an example of this, there was a news outlet that drove through a disaster, sort of a terror-stricken area in Syria, um, and the video was posted up on YouTube. 
And this camera, as it was filming outside of this vehicle and sort of driving along the streets, it was filming a video of the buildings and everything like that in the area. They didn't really stop the camera. One of our employees actually downloaded that YouTube video, imported into Pix4D Mapper, and we were able to process that and they were able to get a 3D model of that actual environment in that roadside street. So if you do have social media photos, um, I mean, ingesting it into the software, we have to have image overlap. So that, that example use case that I just talked about, we had a continuous video. So when we splice that up, we have image overlap. Um, so if you have images on social media that have image overlap, we should be able to process it. So give it a try. Well, I think she was asking a simpler question. That's a really cool answer, actually. But yeah. I think she's asking a simpler question. Can she use our output data, our ortho mosaic, for their volunteer purposes that you know that we produced already? Oh, 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 oh! I, think I so. thought that. I, I thought case, it was. We have to ask Global yeah. Medic, right? If Global Medic actually owns the data in this case, and they've allowed us to use it for demonstration purposes. But uh, we'd have to get you in touch with Global Medic. That, if that's the case, send a note to us, to Josh or myself, and we can ask them. That question makes a lot more sense now, Claudia. But I'm glad you that, asked. That was the cool answer. answer. You really <laughs> can reconstruct things from just about any set of overlapping images with pix 4 Mapper. Uh, we've seen some really, really unique applications. Yeah, and Claudia, there's there's a resource called Open Drone Map. It's a website where uh, UAV uh, pilots can submit their their ortho mosaics uh, for the general public to be able to download. Bobby's asking about what three words. Have you used that, Josh? I've heard of it. It's 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 like it a rant. three words for every location, uh, like within a so many meter area. Right. It tiles it up. Yeah. And then it randomly generates three words for every single location. So if you give those three words, um, they can sort of pinpoint exactly where you're at. I have never used it um, actively. So that would be interesting. That's that's. I could see maybe you importing the ortho mosaic and then overlaying the what three words definitions over that to sort of get a reference. Um, but I haven't worked so much with what three words, but I've heard about it before and I've heard good things. Another one is what's the best app overlap for 3D? Looks like Chris got an answer in there, but the best overlap that we generally recommend is just general use cases is, um, 75%, like Chris said up there, 75% um, and 60 is really good. Um, and then it obviously changes if your project area is looking at different things like vegetation or um, a different scene type. We have a we have a long question from Richard. It says, so on the NV learning algorithm process, how time consuming is the mixed rubble definition process? Uh, I.e., I flew LIDAR EL in Puerto Rico January for earthquake response. Uh, some of those piles were obviously very mixed media. Also, I live on the Gulf, Gulf Coast and the uh, spot weather channel usually points to, points to hurricane models. Would it be more of a de definition of wood versus concrete? Oh, okay, okay. So, like, how would you delineate uh, different types of debris, or is that uh, is it more of is it metal versus you know somebody's teddy bear that flew somewhere? Uh, so, for this example, it was mostly rooftop, and uh, and there's a little bit of um, building material from from siding that I that I found. Uh, I just labeled everything that I thought was debris. I, I could have had subclasses that said roof rooftop debris and uh carpet debris uh and made those separate but uh in this case i only had to just label it debris and it learned those weights because there, there was only so many different colors or variations that you could find so jp is some of that answer focused on um 
you know, the deep learning is looking at spatial feature extraction. You know, in Envy, we have all of our spectral feature classification. So, you know, if you're using the, the broader Envy tool, there might be other ways to take the end result ortho mosaic and potentially do some additional processing on that. Right, you, you could use a combination of feature extraction, which is going to segment the image uh, with that very stark contrast between the grass and that rubble or debris. Uh, you can use that first to identify areas that, all right, this is, this is the, uh, the uniform spectral uh, signature for these features. Uh, you, can, you can then take that and then also submit it to a deep learning uh, process or a spectral classification. And also that, that elevation data would help uh, delineate those features. All right, uh, well, it looks like we're uh, getting to the, towards the end of our time here. Was there anything last uh, anyone wanted to add in? All right, well, I do want to remind people the uh, slides and the presentation will be available, I believe it's next Monday. I hope everybody um, gained some new insight from the presentation and thank you for joining us today. So with that, I'll say bye now. Take care guys. Bye.